Hi, I'm Naisha McCauley, and you're watching AccessTV.org. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm John Mason, and welcome to Downtown with John Mason. My guest today is the great Ernie Hutt, co-owner of Augie and Ray's Restaurant in East Hartford. Ernie, thanks for coming. Oh, thanks for having me. Uh, I want to start with in the beginning. Uh, I know your dad, Ray, started the business with Augie Bria, yes. both uh, East Hartford police officers mm -hmm. at the time. You were four years old, uh, you mentioned earlier. What was the scenario? Was your father looking for extra money? Was Were they looking for a hobby? What was, I mean, I know you were four, but what did you hear for the reason for the for the restaurant? And that was started on Main Street in front of the, your, your building right. now. Mm -hmm. Right. So. Well, what happened, my father was, uh, father was a pretty talented guy. He had uh, worked at the Astor Theater. He had uh, a lot of interest in movies and films, and he also was a very good cook. And... Uh, that was a time where these roadside stands were starting to uh, blossom all mm -hmm. through the areas. Well, and, what uh, else was around then, like uh, of, of hot dog stands? What else was around? Bart's you had, there uh, in Windsor, was, was Harry's yeah, there? Yeah, we had Frankie's Drive-In, which was Sonny D'Amato's. That was up uh, next to the Marco Polo. You had Ski's, Lubinsky's, which was down on... Uh, down on uh, so places local, yes. yeah. Yeah, Larry okay. Boardman was down, and uh, Harry's and Cole. Larry Preston. Boardman was at the boxer. No, Larry? yeah, Larry yeah, Boardman was yeah. the boxer, and he yeah. was down Marlboro. Yeah. And there was yeah. a, there was a lot of different places. Yeah. Blackie's down in Cheshire, and right. yeah, and there right. was a, there was a, up, there was a big thing. So, so it. how did the seed start? How did they? How well, did they, as I said, I think they had an idea that uh, my my dad was a good cook, and. Uh, and he thought it was a good uh, good chance to take a crack at it. Mm -hmm. And I know they worked himself a deal, and they took over. It was a fruit stand, the mm -hmm. uh, the former Augie and Ray's, which is, uh, there's pictures of it. Yeah. And they yeah. started there. And yeah. opening day, my dad's uh, my dad's comment was, you'd be a stranger here but once. And he had the chili recipe, and he had enough good ideas, and enough skill cooking. But, but it seemed like the biggest and the most, the best move was being located Right, right in front next of Pratt. To Pratt when he, absolutely. I mean, was there a, was there a problem getting that spot, or was the the fruit stand you said was already there? Well, I think I think what it was is he had some he had some insight into the future. He says, "This can't you know this can't miss." And mm. uh, he knew enough people. He had worked uh, like at Lombardo's uh, Slaughterhouse, and he had just he he never really talked about himself too much as far as what he knew. Mm. But he was a very very bright person. Mm. Yeah. And from day one, did did you attract the Pratt and Whitney oh, crowd? Oh, from day one, there was yeah. opening day, and they haven't stopped coming. Obviously, years ago when Pratt and Whitney was working thirty five forty thousand people, they had three shifts. Mm -hmm. It was a lot different then. It was mm -hmm. more or less they just uh, opened the doors. And what was the access for Pratt? In other words, because I know there's a fence around the building. Did how were you able to? People have to walk out the main gate to come well, around here. They, yes, they call it Engineering Road, and that was right next to the Engineering Building. And what they would do, they would walk. And the first wave from Pratt and Whitney would call them the eleven o'clock runners, and you could see them coming down Main Street, you know, heading from uh, Pratt and Whitney, and they would take that corner and how they wouldn't prepare, stop. How, how did you prepare for that? What did you actually do? Or, or I guess, what did he actually do back then? Well, basically back then it was like a hot dog, hamburg place. And he did have other no sandwiches. No fries? No, but they had fries. But, uh, no they sandwiches had, like that. Yeah, they had sandwiches, but very limited. But yeah. the big thing they had back then also is, as if you can see with one of the pictures, was it was uh, Augie and Ray's Milk Bar Incorporated. Mm -hmm. And the milk bar came from Hood's Ice Cream. And Hood's Ice Cream was very instrumental. Mm -hmm. And back then there wasn't... Uh, there wasn't the Friendlies yet. There wasn't the Dairies. So mm -hmm. Burnside Dairy was on the other side of town, and we were on our side, and mm -hmm. we were the most two famous places as far as ice cream. So, so what were you saying? So so people came for milk, or you mean? Or, or no, for they ice came cream for products? ice cream and hot dogs. Okay. Like our ice cream was. Okay. Uh, so you were explaining. You saw a wave, a wave of people would yeah. come down. Would he have like things nothing ready? Nothing prepared. Everything was uh, nothing prepared. as today. That's where we separate ourselves. Everything's cooked to order. We don't have any. Thing in boxes. You, don't, you didn't have any sandwiches. No, made. no, as I said, and I think back then we had a we had a fellow's name was Cliff Sear. They called him Frenchy, and he was on a hot dog grill, and he was an expert. We mm. had our Herbie. Oh, what's an expert for a hot uh, dog? Pardon me? What What would be an expert on a hot dog grill? Like what? Fast, what? fast and efficient. Okay. You know, back then, uh, 
back then you'd put a bunch of hot dogs on, you toast your rolls, and uh, and they put the, the timing of yes, when yeah, something's absolutely. done. Yeah, and, and you wouldn't stop. You just keep throwing them on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that continued like uh, because there wasn't any competition back there. Mm -hmm. It was just a steady, uh, it, just a steady uh, run of customers. Yeah. Yeah. You had mentioned you started in the business when you were thirteen. Yes. Mm -hmm. So that's about what uh, in the mid 1950s? 1955. Okay. Yeah. And, and what was your experience? What was your first day on the job like? First day at the job was my father said, "I want you to work tonight." He said somebody didn't show up, so I went down there. And it's interesting how things went because back then kids had more responsibility. I think when I was 12 years old, I had already worked three years. I went over and got my working papers when I was 10 years old over in Hartford. I remember getting them. And what we used to do is we used to work Well, let me stop you yeah. there. Working papers to do what? What were you doing because at 12? Because we were picking a paycheck up on tobacco. Oh, okay. So, so that you, was you were on tobacco? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And uh, I had worked, uh, I'd already worked two years on tobacco. We'd drive the tractors. I was working in the shed when I was 12 Who'd years old. Who'd you work for back Bob then? Bob DiPietro. Okay. And on Forest Street, that was half of Forest Street. Like he, mm -hmm. he had up where Lydell Road is and DePetro Drive. That was mm -hmm. all tobacco mm -hmm. land, both mm -hmm. sides. Mm -hmm. So anyways, I worked a couple of years there. And my dad says, I want you to go into work tonight because somebody didn't show up. So mm -hmm. I showed up for work. And this is, I think, where things have changed as far as kids' responsibility, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. kids being more mature. Mm -hmm. And uh, the fellows knew who I was. And one of them was a former state uh, auxiliary police. The customers, you mean? No, I'm saying as far as the, the crew that the, night. The crew, another, yeah. okay. another fellow was a former high school football star, Herbie Hoffman. And uh, they flipped a coin to find out who was going to get the dirty job. And I knew mm -hmm. they rigged it. So I mm -hmm. wound up with the dishes and picking a lot up. Mm -hmm. And then Cliff Landry, who was an uh, auxiliary state cop, he says, uh, you know how to shoot a gun? I says, yeah. He says, well, we got to test you out to see if you can shoot it. <laughs> so he walked me out back and there was a barrel out back. And he says, here he says, shoot two rounds into the, uh, into the barrel. So no, th this is not part of the job, I would no. assume. No, well, this was part of the job that yeah. night. So yeah. anyways, I fired two <coughs> shots. He says, that's good. He says, where'd you shoot? I says, well, we take target practice. My brother Butch hunts. Yeah. He says, that's good. You handle a gun good. So he brings me in. He says, okay, now I'm going to show you. He says, we got a gun here under the register here. we got a gun up on this register here. We've got a gun out in the back room, in the bathroom. We've got a gun in the auxiliary room. He says, and there's one over here on the side. Now, he says, if you see this guy come in with the big chin, who was Taborski at the time, mm -hmm. and Taborski and Cologne, I believe his name's Cologne. I'm not positive on that, but Taborski. No, Taborski was the mad dog killer. The mad dog killer. Yeah. He says, so what you do, you don't shoot for his head. You just aim for his chest and start shooting. He says, now, he says, the theory behind you is going to get one of us, but not all four. <laughs> I says, no problem. So that was it. And thank God he didn't show up. But, yeah. but yeah. I think that everybody at the time was prepared the same way. Right. But at 13 years old or 12 years old, whatever it was, I'm trying now, to think. Now, was Daborski seen in the area? Cause I well, oh, he yes. He was, he was over was in Hartford. Hartford. Yes, yeah. yeah. And uh, yeah. he had knocked the package store off down below where my grandmother and grandfather lived mm -hmm. down Summit Street. And mm -hmm. I was over there at the time. Yeah. But my father, being a, a former uh, policeman in town, yeah. he wasn't taking any chances. Right. And this kid, uh, this guy, uh, Cliff, Cliff Landry was the same way. They took it serious. Yeah. 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 And they so, took very serious. And, and so you, you, you don't have guns in there anymore, uh, obviously, but that yeah. was just during that oh, time. Oh, yeah, that was during the time. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. But you didn't need guns in there for any no. other reason besides. No, but that. it's like anything else. It's yeah. like if we walk outside, a car could hit us. In other words, you yeah. can't walk around yeah. Yeah. walking scared in life. Yeah. Do you yeah. know what I mean? In other yeah. words, it, you yeah. know, at any time, any anybody come in and yeah. and it's you just don't walk around worrying. Well, what about. did you learn from your father? Let me, Everything. Let me, yeah. Yeah. In what ways? Well, you, give me a few things. What what he taught how you? How to be a man. Yeah. And, and what does that mean? Because how to be a man. I try to. I uh, uh, some of my grandsons, uh, my my grandsons brag about it, is when you're asked a question. You look a fella in the eye and you answer him. Mm -hmm. When you shake hands with another fella, you give him a grip and mm -hmm. you look him in the eye. Mm -hmm. The other thing is, the biggest thing I think I learned at a very young age was my freshman year in high school. I'd been... Uh, you went to East Hartford High. I went to East Hartford High. I was a captain of JV freshman football, football team. Football, yeah. And I was dressed in varsity my <coughs> freshman year. I was pretty proud of myself. Yeah. And yeah. Meantime, the report cards come out. Yeah. And uh, I flunked out. Mm-hmm. So my dad said, what are you bringing the books home for if you're not studying? I said, Dad, mm -hmm. I'm studying. And he grabbed me, by the, grabbed me by the back of the collar 
and my mother says, Ray, and he walked me to the bathroom. And as he walked me to the bathroom, the, the grip was getting tighter and tighter. Yeah. He said, now I want you to look in that mirror, and I want you to tell that guy that you've been studying, because you can bullshit me, and yeah. you can bullshit your teacher, and you can yeah. bullshit your mother. Yeah. But if you can bullshit the guy that's looking back at you, right. then he says, uh, you're good. Yeah. And then I know yeah. I was looking at that guy, and I wasn't being honest with myself. Right. Right. So as I said, that was the last time I flunked out. Really? Yeah. Okay. So he he uh, he ran a tight ship. He he was uh... yes. He also he also was the type of parent that you do as I say and not as I do. Mm -hmm. I didn't realize how I don't know if the word is ah uh, uh, it was just very very big drinking back then. If yeah. I walk watching a series Boardwalk Empire and I didn't realize it was that big, but it was. Mm -hmm. And what he was meaning was. Even though I'm having a beer, don't you ever think that you're gonna have a beer while you're in high school? Mm -hmm. You know, and uh, and it was, it was other things too. Is uh, and uh, I remember one time he didn't want me going out with a particular girl for mm -hmm. a very good reason. Mm -hmm. And uh, don't mention her name, whatever you do. No, <laughs> I wouldn't. I wouldn't. Mm -hmm. And it was because he had a conflict with somebody in the family. Yeah. And somebody in the other family was gonna give me a break and my father right. was proud of his name yeah and he yeah. says you go out with her he says you're not going to be sleeping here yeah. and my mother says ray you can't do that yeah and he says betty you'll be sleeping with them too yeah. yeah so my mother looked at me she says ernie there's a lot of girls out there mm -hmm. he wasn't kidding and back mm -hmm. then i think the big thing i loved back then is they were on the same page yeah yeah parents. The, yeah the parents would back each other right. and i think that that is one of our that's one of our real real uh disasters in families right mm -hmm. now is mm -hmm. uh, the kids Splitting. they don't do it deliberately but they divide and they yeah yeah and yeah. and the parents instead of uh, having a little bit of an argument they just give in mm -hmm. and I don't believe in that yeah. I believe in yeah. you know what Staying what's right is right united yes. yeah. front what well, we'll, we'll talk about uh, let's talk about the um, you know as you took over the business and how you got involved in the business was there ever any question that you didn't want the business or was it a for taken that you were going to eventually you and your brother butch you had mentioned yeah. take over was there ever, ever a point where you said dad i want to you know well you know. there was a lot of stuff that had gone on which i'd rather not mention cuz mm -hmm. there's some bad feelings on it and, yeah but yeah. what I had to do is I had to, uh, I had to, uh, I had four children and... Uh, well, I'm talking about you in general. When yes, you, I'm when saying you, me in general. Yeah, yeah. And I, it was the job I had. I didn't go to school. A college, and, you mean? To college, yeah. yeah. And no, you really, played football yeah. at East Hartford yeah. and, and you were a standout uh, baseball, football player. Yeah. Baseball, baseball too? Yeah. Yeah. But my did, point is, that I got married young and had four children very young. And did was, you think about, where, did you want to go to college or did you... Think, uh, I did. I took one crack at it. Yeah. And, uh, Where'd you go? No, no, I took one, oh. I, in other words, I applied to one place, okay. and I did not study. Yeah. I did not study at all. Yeah. Uh, I, uh, the big thing, I, I consider my father like a genius in life. Yeah. And uh, the one thing he didn't do, and I probably was, and I tried to figure it out, he sent me to school early. And I think the reason for it... Uh, the, high school, you no, mean? No, uh, uh, yeah, he, he sent me to kindergarten yeah. one year early, because when I played on our state championship Little League team... I was in eighth grade, and there was one other eighth grade, and the rest of the kids were seventh graders, mm -hmm. so meaning I was one year ahead. Mm -hmm. And where that really didn't help me an awful lot was my first year out of high school, mm -hmm. I went into service. Mm -hmm. And uh, one year out of high school, I'd gone from 155 to 180. Mm -hmm. And obviously speaking, being a senior at 180 playing middle linebacker and mm -hmm. being a catcher mm -hmm. at 180, mm -hmm. And still in good shape, it would yeah. help me up tremendously. But as I think, what happened back then is the parents had a tendency. If there was a lot of kids in the house, they mm -hmm. would send them a little bit earlier. Mm -hmm. Now, what what did you have for siblings? I, I, I'm not. Pardon me? What did you have for siblings in, in your house? Uh, I know had, your brother uh, Butch. Had, uh, I had uh, two brothers, Ray and Butch, and yeah. two sisters, Mary and Elizabeth. Okay. Yeah. So I was the middle one. Yeah. yeah. And so, so you went right into the business right after high school? Or right you after went into high the school, service? yes. Yeah, right after high school, <coughs> what I did, I started, and then I volunteered for the National Guard. I went in, and I served uh, six months active duty, and then mm -hmm. I, uh, I, I did my, uh, you know, my weekend uh, mm -hmm. meetings. We're going we're gonna to take a break, and we'll be right back. Okay. Okay. Thank you.
Welcome back. This is John Mason. I'm with Ernie Hutt, owner of Logging and Rays in East Hartford, Connecticut. Ernie, thanks for coming again. Thanks for uh, having me. We were talking about uh, the um, how the business has changed, or how you when you first got into the business, mm -hmm. or as you got in the '60s and '70s. Mm -hmm. What changed for your the menu? How, how did the menu change, or did did it change at all? And and the big thing I have to say the big thing, and I then I, I credit my father for it, is we uh, as maybe sixteen year old kids. Uh, my father sent me and my two brothers up to Jolly Charlie's up in North Attleboro, Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. And he had Jolly Charlie's is what? Is a, was a roadside stand. Mm -hmm. And Jolly Charlie is in North Attleboro, Massachusetts. He was famous for onion rings. So my dad uh, had a connection, knew him, and a fellow like my dad. So we went up there. We worked for a few days, learned how to make the onion rings. And I think that that's one of the, was one of the kings. I think the uh, keys was... Uh, uh, I'm not going to say we're famous because anybody say they're famous, they're patting their back, but we've got a very good reputation with onion rings. We mm -hmm. spend an awful lot of time with them. Mm -hmm. They're all handmade, uh, and we've got procedures with them. And what did you learn up at uh, Jolly Charlie's? How to make the onion rings. Yeah. 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 And as I said, it's not it's not just a slam dunk. Well, how we, were they made, and, and how were they made? We never the, had them. You never had them? Never had them. Okay. This was opening of the new place. Plus, out in the, uh, we call it the... Uh, the stand. That's how any of the old timers will say, um, and that goes back to my mom. He's down the stand. He's down the stand. Then now it's it was original, a original stand. original building. You mean? Yeah, it was a roadside stand. And then what stand. year did you move to the to the? It was 1958. 1958. So now, as we moved in 1958, 1959, give or take a couple months there, my dad come up with the uh, with the onion ring and he duplicated being a cook he was. And then we started having belly clams and uh So he's in saying it, it, we need more than just hot dogs yeah. and hamburgers. Yeah, because we didn't have the room out in the other place. Now we've got this new ultra modern uh, state of the art building mm -hmm. and uh, we had plenty of room. And we also had expanded our ice cream. I mean, our ice cream was uh, tremendous. I mean, I could tell you some of the the volumes, like we sell, we'll sell a couple gallons of clams on a weekend right now. We used to sell 14 back then. 14 gallons, yeah. And uh, it's just, it's just the amount of people that were at Pratt Whitney, the hours. We were open until 12:30 on count of Pratt Whitney. Wow. And now we're open until seven o'clock at night. Yeah. So you would open at what time back in the heyday? Probably eight o'clock. We didn't have you out. And uh, but back then, uh, you've been in there more. And what we do yeah. is you get. Uh, one after another after another just it's a continuous flow mm -hmm. but back then we had two lines that were drawn towards the register mm -hmm. we did not have the breakfast menu we have now mm -hmm. it was just hard rolls and mm -hmm. really coffee but i mean mm -hmm. that's all. so people would actually be lined up out the door oh, both sides yep, coming <coughs> and, yep. and when did you i mean did you uh when did you put the outside seat seating uh, uh that was done that was done probably just about the same time. We've mm -hmm. always had benches out there, which mm -hmm. is very good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What's the hardest part about the business today? Uh, not the hardest part. The most important part is staying focused. Mm -hmm. Just staying focused. Remember, and I live by, I've got my grandson Michael and my daughter Lisa there, and I preach that you're only as good as today. Mm -hmm. Forget yesterday. It's just mm -hmm. like a ball game. Mm -hmm. You could have won had 25 points last night, mm -hmm. and the guy playing you tomorrow mm -hmm. could care less about it. So mm -hmm. you just have to keep reproving yourself. Mm -hmm. Rotating stock, keeping fresh, staying on top of everything. Mm -hmm. And the oldest saying is, don't serve anything that you wouldn't eat yourself. Mm -hmm. So if an egg doesn't look right on the grill, it broke or something scrambled up, or ham fried a little bit too much, or the bacon's mm -hmm. not done enough, if you're going to eat it, otherwise don't serve it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, and, and let's talk about let, let's switch gears. I want to talk about sports. It seems like you've always been involved in sports, mm -hmm. and you've always supported teams mm -hmm. in, in the town. Why is that so? And, and how how big of a part has sports played in, in your life and in the business in the life of the business? Well, back when my dad, back when my dad was raising a family. Back then, the fathers worked, and that's all they had time for because the mom stayed home. The, all they had time for what? To work. The, to work, yeah. yeah. And uh, <coughs> what I did at Billy Waples and Kent Lee and Whitey May, and I could keep on on and on as far as the These people. are ball players? No, or? these were coaches. Coaches. As far yeah. as, yeah, just volunteering their time. Mr. Dwyer, and, uh, but I always 
tried to help. Jimmy Perucho helped me when he was 12 years old. I always tried to help kids, and it came natural mm -hmm. to me, mm -hmm. coaching. And uh, I played ball until I was probably 28 years old in a Twilight League, and, and then my son come along, Kevin, and, and I showed him how to hit. And once I started getting involved, like with his teams and even before that, mm -hmm. I just fell in love with it because mm -hmm. what I got back from coaching was, and I still have it today, is that I have respect from the kids. In mm -hmm. other words, some of these fathers today, some of them can't. They have the same problem they did back in yesteryear. Mm -hmm. But all these guys just don't take the time to spend with their kids, mm -hmm. and I think it's priceless. Mm -hmm. What about the, the, the actual supporting teams, though? How important is that for you? Like, you see the sponsor a lot of teams, well, a lot of your... yeah. <coughs> uh, I mean, what, what, what is your thinking with that, that you're part of the community? Yes, that you wanna... absolutely. Yep. Yep. And in last year, I mean, you don't ask for anything, but last year the Rotary Club uh, gave me a special award, mm -hmm. and, you know, for all the stuff that we try to do there. And mm -hmm. I think it comes natural. I mm -hmm. just really think mm -hmm. it does. In other words, if you got a couple extra bucks, spend it on the kids. The mm -hmm. kids, and the same thing, I, I was very involved with the uh, St. Christopher program because mm -hmm. my little granddaughter went there for nine years. She's now an mm -hmm. East Catholic, mm -hmm. and I was, I was able to coach the girls' basketball team for five years, mm -hmm. and that was absolutely priceless. Mm -hmm. I've got, I've been coaching the girls' basketball team. I've, I'll, I'll have the fondest memories in my life with mm -hmm. that team. Mm -hmm. The kids were just phenomenal. Mm -hmm. and, and I want to mention a name that, that everybody in East Hartford knows, and I had mentioned it earlier, Ray McKenna. What do you think the influence he had on sports in East Hartford, and, and what was your relationship like with him? What, what? Well, Ray, Ray was a... Uh, Ray was probably as a fierce competitor that ever come yeah, along. When he was young, you mean, yeah, yeah, ever come along. And, and you know, I don't remember Ray. Yeah, as, as and an my athlete. brother Ray was playing flag football, and Ray, Ray didn't. Ray was win. Ray, your brother Ray. No, McKenna. no, Ray, Ray McKenna, Ray McKenna was McKenna. win. So my my brother Ray mentioned to my dad that he was a little bit ticked off with Ray McKenna yeah. and. My father very politely told him, well, if you get into a beef with him, you're on your own. Yeah. Because yeah. Ray was a boxing champ in, yeah. the, in the service. And, yeah. uh, but the things that Raymond Kenna did, like he brought stuff to East Hartford that is mind-boggling. Yeah. He had yeah. Wilt Chamberlain. Wilt Chamberlain, he had, yeah. I know. Uh, Ernie DiGregorio. He yeah. Bob Cousy there. He had the yeah. New York Giants there. Yeah. And one story I love to tell as far as Bob Cousy's playing against Bobby Knight, who was... Absolutely, your dad remembers him. He can tell you a story, but yeah. But he's playing against uh, Bob Cousy. Is playing against uh, Bobby Knight, and they're up at the East Hartford High School, and it's just a, it's just a game. Mm -hmm. And I think he gave Bob Cousy fifty dollars to come, and Bob Cousy got so wound up in the game, he made a shot at the end. He's running down the court like pumping his fist, like he's in the Boston Garden mm -hmm. in the NBA final. And I'm trying to think, and I've got nothing against LeBron James or any of these other fellows. Yeah. But I can't imagine LeBron James or Kobe Bryant being down East Hartford High School yeah. for fifty dollars, yeah. yeah. playing like it's during how, the NBA how, final. How did he do that? Like we just did. You know, uh, back then, I think if you took a look, and I've got a pretty good memory on. I mean, salaries. it's not the money, Will Chamberlain. You know, uh, no, what it was, and it was the money. <laughs> It was the yeah, money. it was the money. In other words, like the New York Football Giants would show up, and they were probably making six, seven, eight, ten thousand dollars a year. Mm. And Ray would give them fifty bucks, three or four times a winter, and it paid for stuff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they were on tour, so they mm -hmm. just went around, and they it was like a part time job for them in the winter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So let, let, let's change. Uh, how about other people in East Hartford that you've. Uh, worked with or, or people uh, uh larson has been uh, john larson's been phenomenal yeah, yeah. john larson is uh, all east harford he's all pratt whitney and uh, uh john larson has uh, he's just done a wonderful job mm -hmm. yeah supportive of, yeah. of, of uh, now we've got another fellow up at st christopher's guy john burns who's been in uh he's been in the, uh, the parochial school system for 38 years mm -hmm. uh i've never had never had the opportunity to coach with anybody like him he's mm. at every game he's involved in everything he does mm. it for the love of it mm. just for the love of it it seems like you love your town and, yes and, i do yeah, yes yeah. Mm -hmm. what, what is it about east hartford that that for you um, is so special the fact that i was know. proud about every part about east hartford i grew up in maryville village i cried when i left it mm. uh, when did you leave it uh, well, I loved, we left it when I was probably 1952. I think I was mm -hmm. 10 years old. Now, Larson grew up in Maybury yes, Village, Yes, he did. Too. He did. And okay. we drive through uh, Memory Village. I'll uh, bring my children, my grandchildren, th throwing this. 
uh, Baba, uh, how did you ever, uh, Baba, how did you ever, all you people live in that house? I mm. said, well, we only had seven, and mm. they tried seven. I said, yep. Yeah. Well, hold on one minute. I'm going to bring you over. This is where John Larson lived, mm. and he had ten. Really? And nobody complained about being, yeah, and it was just, yeah. it was the love. It yeah. was just, uh, you got to know your brothers and sisters, yeah. and your neighbors were phenomenal. Yeah. What about today in the business? What, what, what's your schedule like? Like, are you up there in the morning? Are you? Uh, how, I wake how, up at three thirty. I go in at four o'clock. Now, why would you go in? And why would you get up at three thirty anyway? Uh, because What's, what there, happens is no... I've got some customers that come through the door at four thirty. They say, "Well, four thirty. Well, they come in. They spend between about four or five guys about fifty, sixty dollars. Yeah. So if you go that times five, yeah. it's six. It's yeah. three, four hundred dollars a week. Yeah. It's paying for yeah. something. Stuff. And the other thing I do is I get a chance to. Prepare the place because yeah. I do like to get out at eleven o'clock. I do like to as soon as I so get home. Work, you'll, you'll yeah, get as soon as I get home, I take the uh, my dog for a walk, buddy, <coughs> buddy hut for a walk, and uh, mm -hmm. then uh, my grandson and I play, play golf, and uh, my little granddaughter Brenna. I go to see my uh, little grandson uh, uh, Sammy, uh, uh, Sammy the Bull. Mm -hmm. I, I go watch him play, and I mm -hmm. pitch him batting practice. So it gives me a chance. Yeah, I also feel uh, very blessed and fortunate at 71 years old. I yeah. keep myself in pretty good shape, yeah. and I do not take that for granted. I yeah. just, I just, I just feel like I'm blessed. So like, I want to. How, how do you keep yourself in shape? Because I saw you at a road day. race once. Yeah. And, uh, yes, I do the Manchester Road Race, the <laughs> Azelton Road Race. And I push myself. I mm -hmm. walk two, three miles every day. Mm -hmm. And as far as the business now, Lisa, your daughter, mm -hmm. is pretty much running the business? No, Michael and Lisa. <coughs> Michael, Michael is... Yeah, Michael's my grandson. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and looking back on, on your role in Augie and Ray's, what do you think of your career up until, uh, you know, this point? I mean, I know you're not well, going anywhere. Well, the big but... thing is, the big thing is, like, I've, uh, they asked me one time, uh, what's changed at Augie and Ray's? And at the time, I had been to... Uh, four wakes of uh, former employees' parents. Mm -hmm. I said, what's changed? I said, I've been to four wakes this year and we had 16 children, uh, five one family, three another, and four the other two. Not that I have to mention the families. Mm -hmm. We had 16 kids working here. So in other words, the brother would get a job, his brother, his brother, and his sister. Mm -hmm. Now what happens, and this is 15 years ago, uh, we don't have a kid from the high school working. That's what's changed. Mm -hmm. And the thing I feel that is phenomenal, we had I mean, I could mention Bobby E. Crescenza because he's mayor and Timmy Larson because he is mayor. And mm -hmm. I could go on. These are and former on. employees. Yeah. And we've had doctors, lawyers. We've mm -hmm. had clergy. And yeah. it's been it's been mm -hmm. a nice run. It really has. Now, I just, I, we're going to wrap up in a minute. But I just want to ask you about the how John Larson got his own breakfast sandwich. Uh, what what How does one go about getting a sandwich or a meal named after them? And who do you have uh, besides Larson uh, as far as uh, giving them a name? Mm -hmm. Does Oprah have a... Uh, no. no. No, as John Larson comes in, he'd always want a ham, egg, and cheese with peppers and tomatoes. So, so you said, gave him the... Yeah. And uh, Mark Now, when he comes yeah. in, does he say, I want oh, a John Larson? No, no. Or would, would he just... Well, one thing recently, and it was very recently, there was an article in the paper that says, yes, there is an Augie race. Because mm -hmm. John brought up two senators from... He brought up two Republicans and two Democrats. We yeah. had four... Two congressmen, too. But anyways, when they went back to Washington... Uh -huh. The headline down there was, yes, there is an arguing race, because oh, he's always talking funny. about arguing race, and they thought it was funny. just some fantasy he was yeah. talking about. Yeah. And that's Mark great. Scheinberg's another one of our big boosters. We got and a sandwich is, named after him. We he, got Chris Stone, our lawyer. Mark Scheinberg is from he's, he's Goodwin, a, yeah, Good, Good, yeah. Goodwin College. Yeah. yeah, and Chris Stone, our lawyer, he's our corporation lawyer, and he uh -huh. helps us with everything. Yeah. And as I said, I can't thank enough of these people. And that's really what, how we've done it as far as... People helping us too. Yeah, every, everybody I talk to loves Augie and Race. Mm -hmm. Just last question: How, mm -hmm. how do you uh, how do you see Augie and Race in the future? What, what, what's what's uh, you had said mentioned? Uh, well, Pat Whitney is hopefully is, that uh, hopefully there's going to be some big stuff going out back, and uh, with the new mall coming in, and my son Kevin, I'm not sure exactly what his plans are, but mm -hmm. if he retires in five years. I'd like to see him become part partnership with Lisa and Michael and between the three of them I think they can carry it as long as they want. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this way here you'll have another place for the grand great grandchildren to work. Yeah. Well nineteen forty six, what how many years is that are we talking about? Sixty nine. Sixty nine mm -hmm. years. Ernie, thank you. Oh thank, thank you. Okay. Great.